Realmente, good morning. It's a beautiful day. My eyes are crooked. I set this up all crooked. So, I was talking to a few people as I was walking into church. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, or we're going to recognize you here in a second, it might feel a little different here. What you're feeling is the presence of God. It's that Holy Spirit moving. There are things that are happening here at Remanente, and we're so happy that you're joining us. Today we have Ryan Walker. Congratulations. I give Ryan a loud round of applause. And we have Miss Tori Graham. So, Miss Tori, welcome. Welcome. And remember, Remanente Church, we're a multicultural church. You know, I'm up here preaching in English, but, you know, some Spanish might come out. That's okay. Don't be scared. Okay? So, we welcome you. This is your home. You know, we have a saying um, here in Remanente, especially in the Spanish and the uh, Hispanic culture. Mi casa, su casa. Right? It doesn't translate to well. My house, your house? It's like, eh. It doesn't work. But what we're saying is, whatever I have, you have. And that's a spirit that we carry in a relationship with God. If you have something, you share it. And we have something very special here at Remanente that we want to share it with everybody. So continue inviting your friends and family so we can all share what God has for us here. Today we continue in our series, Reencountering. Reencountering. Something beautiful happened as it usually does as I'm prepping. All week, We've been dealing with a theme of living out our living testimony, the living testament. Before someone reads the Old Testament, if they don't know Christ, and they're in your circle of friends or family, before they read the Old Testament or the New Testament, they're going to read something first, which is the living testament. Some of you might ask, what is the living testament? That is your living testament. How are you living out what you believe? There's a lot of people, have you ever met somebody, not none of us, but of course. But you ever met somebody like, you're Christian? And you look at them all sideways. And hopefully not, maybe they look at you like, wait, you're a Christian? Because maybe you were embarrassed to share that. Or maybe we weren't living the way we should have been living. I know in my life. I've had people that are not Christian question me and kind of correct me on how to be a better Christian. Think about that. I've maybe said something or, or joked around. They're like, you? Thankfully, this hasn't happened in a recent while, but it has happened. I admit it. But what happens when we re-encounter our old life? With a new faith. Many of you are exploring this new walk with Christianity. Walking with Christ, you are now beginning to understand what that is. You're feeling a transformation. You're speaking differently. You're feeling differently. You're walking differently. But what do you do when your new faith is encountered with your old life? Those of you who know me, been with me for a while, understand... People on the submarine call me D because we address each other by our last names, De Leon. But for short, you know, a lot of people can't say De Leon, De Leon, De Leon, De Leo. Like, no, just, so they would say D. And Alex, D, has an old life. They called it Old D. They knew my old life. They knew my old life before I gave my life to Christ. And they could see, and these are not Christians, but they could see a difference between how old D would handle something and how new D would handle something. We become transformed. What do you do? Maybe some of you have already encountered, after the Colombian trip, after you give your life to God here, people are like, you're different. Sometimes that may be uh, allowing some conflict to come into your life. What do you do? How do you handle that? 
So that's what we're going to talk about today. I titled this sermon, Reencountering Our Old Lives with New Faith. Reencountering Our Old Lives with New Faith. We have to step out of our comfort zone. When I went to my second submarine, on my first submarine, I wasn't Christian. But my second submarine, I'm like, I'm going to be Christian. But I had a thought. I'm like, am I brave enough to do that? Because I remember there was a Christian on my first submarine. I remember it vividly. Nicest guy in the world. Short guy, really nice guy. Always well put together. Never said a bad word. But I remember everybody bullied him. Everybody picked on him because they're like, oh, you think you're too good for us. You think you're, you think you're so much better than us. And he never said that. He goes, no, guys, it's okay. I love you all. And they would laugh at him. And I remember that vividly because I never laughed at him, but I never defended him. I never defended him. And I prided myself in being able to defend others and protect others. It is in my nature. It is why I joined and served in the military. But having a friend, a brother, whom I went to war with, when he was being attacked, when he was being bullied and picked on, I never stood up for him. Because I said, well, if I stand up for him, I'm not Christian, but they're going to think I'm Christian, and they're probably going to make fun of me. And I was popular on the submarine. I had a supervisory position. Everybody knew me. I'm like, I don't want them to see me differently. Remember, this was my first submarine. I wasn't Christian. Then. I knew of God, but I didn't feel at the time I was worthy. What kind of conflicts arise in your life? Those of you who are working and being transformed. James chapter 2, verse 26, reminds us of something. James chapter 2, verse 26, the Bible says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works is dead also. Those of you who read the Bible and study the Bible might understand this phrase is becoming very taboo. This topic of a works faith religion and not a faith religion, it's, it, it gets very contentious. People get offended by this topic. But we have a saying where I'm from in Los Angeles, I ain't scared. We're going to dive into this. So I encourage you, don't be scared. We're going to talk about facts. We're going to talk about facts. This is reminding us that the body without the spirit is dead. Your faith without working out and living out your faith is dead also. Some people might say, well, doesn't the Bible say all you need is faith? All you need to do is believe. Yes, the Bible does say that, but it says more right after that. When people bring up the Bible and say, well, it says this, take it in context. Those of you who did a Bible study compendium number one with me, remember, you have to take it in context. What is the whole verse, or did they just stop at a very convenient location? We're going to get to it later, but I'll tell you this, just to make sure you don't think Pastor Alex has gone off sideways. I'm going to say a statement. The Bible says that even demons believe in one God. Demons believe in Jesus. Those are demons. So right there is evidence, facts, that you can't just believe. That's what this is telling us. Faith without works is dead. And we're going to delve into this a little bit longer. Faith and action must go hand in hand. Faith and action must go hand in hand. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible in James chapter 2 Verse 14 and verse 17 <clears throat> tell us the following. Faith without works is dead. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brothers, if someone says he has faith 
but does not have works. What does it profit, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him alone? What do you guys think? We've already discussed that even demons have faith. Even demons believe in God. They recognize Jesus. But this is reminding us and is setting a foundation. What does it profit you if someone says they have faith but doesn't live it out? Remember what this looks like. You might see people at school, at work, in your circles, and they're like, I'm Christian. Oh, cool. But they don't live a Christian life. I have faith in God, but they don't obey God. That's what we're starting to talk about. We have to obey. We love to say, yes, I'm Christian, but sometimes we don't like the other part. We have to obey. We have to walk out our faith. We have to live it out. And this is reminding him, what does it profit you if you don't do that? Verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of, of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? I'm going to paraphrase this for you. Let's just say you're walking down the street. And then you see someone begging for food, for water. And you see that they're in need. What does it profit anybody if you just say, go in peace. Be warmed and be filled. Jesus loves you. Like, okay, that's, that Jesus loves me, but I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm cold. Knowing that you have a dollar in your pocket, you just ate, you're full. You're walking because you're so full. Like, oh, I need to go for a walk. I'm so full. But there's somebody who needs something. I love how it ends. What does it profit? What good is it? What good is your faith if you can't improve the lives of somebody else? What good is it? I know this is heavy. Bear with me. Verse 17. Verse 17. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. <clears throat> if it does not have works, it is dead. Faith by itself. You need to remember this. It's not enough to just believe. It's not enough to just have faith. Because faith alone is really just a thought. It's how you live out that faith that proves your faith. That doesn't make this a works-based religion. Be very mindful about that. This is where people get upset. This is a relationship with Christ. Being Christian means I follow Christ. I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I choose to live this lifestyle. This lifestyle that is directed by this book the Bible, which gives us the instructions of how we should live our lives. It gives us lessons of what not to do. It gives us guidance. It gives us wisdom. It comforts us. It's the living word of God. This passage emphasizes that faith should manifest in our actions. Another way of saying that is, if you have faith, People should be able to see that based on how you live your life. If we have faith but fail to act upon it, it's like offering empty words without any substance. Like the example that I gave. Someone needing help and you're like, I'm going to pray for you, but can you help me? No, no, no. God will come. Like, what are we doing? Living out our faith requires us to demonstrate our love and compassion through tangible deeds. Tangible means something you can see, something you can handle, something you can feel. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. They might say that. You have faith, but I have works. 
Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. The Bible itself recognizes this is contentious, and people are going to be religious about it. This is not a works-based religion, Alex. That's not what I'm saying. I'm only talking about what the Bible is saying. And the Bible is reminding us, I will show you my faith by how I live my life. I will show you my faith by my works. You're going to be able to see my faith. Because look at how I'm living my life. People are going to see your faith by how you deal with new situations. People are going to see your faith by how you deal with old situations. Somebody this week was sharing with me. They were like, boss, I'm so proud of myself because I'm catching myself in how I used to think and how I used to react. And I feel different. And I said, how do you feel about this? He goes, I feel so much more at peace. Because I was always angry. I always thought everybody was attacking me. But I'm trying to be different. And I'm seeing things change in my life. This is a living testimony. This is the living testament. When you obey and you demonstrate your faith by your actions and your works, you will see transformation in your life. The Bible said it. People are like, how do you know it's true? I'm living it. I'm living the word of God. You are living the word of God. There's so many people here experiencing transformation. And people still ask, well, how do you know it's true? How do you really know? Try it. Don't be scared. Remember that even demons believe there's a God. You may hear people in the world say, I believe there's a God, but they don't live their life as there really was a God. You ask me, what do you believe? Well, I, I believe there's a God. Cool. But they don't live their life that way. There's tons of people that believe in God. They just don't choose to act out their faith. They don't act like what they believe. Point number two. Point number one, faith and action must go hand in hand. The second point Transfo be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Like the example I gave of the young woman who's saying, I feel different, I sound different, I'm reacting different. Old me would have snapped. Old me would have told somebody off. But I really am trying, boss. And I'm like, I see it. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible tells us, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love this verse because it goes to the degree of what psychologists come to know very well, of what science is saying. You want to change your life, you have to change your thoughts. You want to change your circumstances, you have to change your thoughts. You want to change your perspective, you have to change your thoughts. Well, that's not new science. That's not new psychology. It was written here thousands of years ago for us. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't think like everybody else in the world thinks. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change your thoughts. Learn to see things with a new perspective. You might be asking, well, what is this new perspective? Here you go. This is all the perspective you need. This teaches us and guides us on how we can see circumstances very differently. That you may prove, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love this because it's a call to us. This is saying you. It doesn't say the person next to you. It doesn't say the person behind you. It doesn't say your parents. It doesn't say the pastors. What does it say? You. 
so you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. This is talking about a relationship between you, us, and our Father in heaven. And that when we transform ourselves by the renewing of our mind, by looking at things through a new perspective, a new lens, we will be able to prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what you have gone through in life. I don't care about the mistakes you made before you walked through these doors. I don't care. The only thing that matters is are you willing and open to receive Jesus as your Savior, to grab onto that faith and walk it out, to walk out your life in your new faith. It's not easy. It never claims to be easy. But it does say it is easier than living out in the world. Because here you find a degree of peace in the middle of a storm. Here we accept God, the creator of the universe, that miracles happen. <coughs> this morning I was sharing with Erlen about, and, and, and I lose something beautiful happened. As I was prepping this week, I felt this word, and I've been prepping this word all week. And then I prep it. I rest, I wake up, I rest, I wake up, I'm struggling. All right, God, please let this be your word. And I always ask God, God, please, Dad, if you can show me that this is you, confirm it. It's just, I ask him. And a very intimate, just, God, just show me. I want to make sure this is of you. This morning, I'm working it, I'm reading it, I'm changing this, changing that. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to send out a daily devotional to a little chat group that we have. And I go to the book because I, it's a devotional that I do for myself. So I go to August 27th. I open to August 27th, and I read the devotional. And I can't make this up because it's dated August 27th. But that's exactly what we're talking here today. I was prepping that during the week. I didn't know that that was a devotion for today. And Erin was like, there's, no, there's never any coincidences. Because I felt it in my heart. I felt it. I'm like, this is the word. These are the verses. And God just talking and confirming. Before I came up here, he confirmed it two or three times through different people. Again, God being a gracious God, saying, this is what I want you to talk about. There is, ne there is never any coincidences when we walk with God. The end of that verse of Romans 12, chapter 2, or verse 2, excuse me, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This transformation equips us to be able to understand and acknowledge what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Things that are good, things that are acceptable. So we can reveal the perfect will of God for our lives. The third point that I want to bring to you guys is faith that produces fruit. Faith that produces fruit. You see, on my first submarine, I had faith. I knew God. I knew God existed. I didn't have a relationship with him, and I definitely wasn't living my life according to his rules. But I believed. I had faith. I just was not obeying. You see, my faith had no fruit. My faith, I wasn't acting out on it. I wasn't walking on it. So I couldn't demonstrate to anybody that I believed. I believed with up here, with my mind. But I never believed with my heart because I wasn't transformed. So I continued to live a very reckless life, a very dangerous life. A very violent life. Because I didn't give God my heart so I can be transformed. But when you have faith, and you want to know if it's a good faith, good faith produces fruit. What does the Bible tell us? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. When you are living in the fruit of the Spirit, you have love, you have joy, you have peace, long-suffering, kindness. You share these things. I was not having any of these fruits in my life. I was angry. I was violent. I was abrasive. I didn't, my, my faith had no fruits. <clears throat> it had no fruits. Verse 23. It continues, gentleness, self-control. Against such, against all these things, there is no law. The Bible is saying the fruits of the Spirit are this, and against these there is no law. There is nothing that supersedes this. <clears throat> How do you share your faith? How do you have fruits of the Spirit? You have to share these things. You have to be gentle. You have to have self-control. Like the young lady who was telling me, boss, I'm different. So-and-so said this, and I was going to react, but I didn't. That's self-control. That's self-control. There's already fruits from everybody's faith as you begin that transformation. Living out our faith is not just about going through the motions, but producing fruit that reflects the character of Christ. The fruit of your faith represents the character of Christ. So if you can be nasty with people, and you have a nasty attitude, I'm sorry to tell you, that is not the character of Christ. Everybody has bad days. I'm not condemning anybody. But if every day you're a nasty person, that's not the character of Christ. You're allowed to make mistakes. And what happens when we make a mistake? What happens when we make a mistake? The fruit is evidence in our relationships and how, do we, how we respond to others in challenges. How do we react in challenges with our new faith in our, and, and in our daily interactions with others? It is a testimony to the transforming power of God. I'm so proud of so many of you because you're already demonstrating a great transformation. The challenge now is how do we continue it? How do we grow it? How do we share it? So you can invite more people, so you can say, hey, I found something that's changing my life. I want to share it with you. It's like finding a really nice restaurant. How many of you like to eat? Show your hands. I'm gonna, don't get hungry on me, okay? <clears throat> but you find this really amazing food place. Think about your amazing food place right now. No, don't get hungry. What do you want to do? You want to share. You want to tell your friends, oh, my gosh, I went to this restaurant. Oh, they had the best tacos. Oh, they had the best pho. Oh, it was the best sushi. If you ask Ezekiel and you talk about sushi, don't do it. He's going to try to convince you to take him. Ezekiel's my little six-year-old. If you say sushi, he goes, sushi? Sushi? So cute. But when you find something that is valuable, when you find something that is delicious, when you find something that is great, you want to share it. <clears throat> what does everybody do when you get that beautiful plate of food in this new spot? What do you do? Take a picture, post it. Hey. Because you want to share it. But when it comes to our faith, Oh, they're going to think I'm too Christian. They're going to think I'm too holy. Share it. That doesn't mean go and smack people with the word of God. That doesn't mean go smack people with the Bible. But be gentle, kind, demonstrate self-control, have joy in difficult situations in the middle of a storm. What happens when we fall? Oh, I made a mistake. They're going to judge me. Sometimes it's the fear of failing 
It's the fear of failing publicly. Well, if I say I'm Christian and then I make a mistake, they're going to think I'm not Christian. So I'd rather not tell them I'm Christian so I don't fall or fail publicly. We're scared. And I already told you guys, what does Pastor Alex say? Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared to make a mistake. And I'm going to tell you guys why. What happens when we falter? What happens when we fail? There's a person in the Bible that I talk a lot about. Peter. Peter was rough. But Peter did something amazing. I didn't give these verses to media because I want you guys to listen to what I'm going to tell you. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. The Bible says, and Peter answered to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So let me break this down for you. Peter and the disciples were in a boat. In the middle of a storm, there was waves, it was dark, it was cold, it was windy. They were getting wet. And they were scared. Originally, they thought it was a ghost. But it was Jesus walking on water. But Peter's faith was bold enough to say, Lord, if it is you, call me, and I will come to you. What does the Bible say? On the water. Peter was saying, I'll walk on water for you, Lord. I have so much faith in you, Jesus. Call me. If it is you and you call me, I will get out of this boat and I will walk on water. Jesus responds, come, come. When I read that, I'm like, "Woo!" what would you do if Jesus looked at you and said, come here? Ooh. And when Peter got out of the boat, he walked on water to go to Jesus. So Peter had faith. He said, call me. Jesus said, come here. Peter's like, okay. And Peter gets out of the boat. But his focus was not on doing the miracle. His focus was on getting closer to Jesus. His focus was not on walking the water and doing the miracle. His focus was on getting closer to Jesus. In a scary moment, in a scary circumstance, in a tough situation. So Peter gets out and he walks. But then something happened. Peter loses focus. The Bible says in verse 30, but when Peter saw the wind was boisterous, the wind was loud and heavy, he was afraid. He was afraid and he began to sink. And he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Save me. Peter had the faith. Peter stepped out of his comfort zone and said, I just want to be closer to you, Jesus. And he was walking on water. But when Peter started focusing on his circumstances, on the storm, on how scary it was, on the wind and how wet he was, he started to sink. He took his eye off the prize. He took his focus off of Jesus. He made a mistake. Imagine the disciples are like, ah, you thought you could walk on water. They could have made fun of him. Ah, look at you, you're all wet. But it doesn't tell us that. But imagine if you were in that situation. Some of you are walking on water right now. Some of you are living now your miracle. Because it's changing your life. Don't be afraid to get out of the boat. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Don't be afraid to lose focus. Because if you start sinking, you're only highlighting how good Jesus is and that he will be right next to you and he won't let you drown. Who says amen to that? Give the Lord a loud round of applause. Everybody, please stand as we begin to close. If the worship team can help me out on stage.
just because you say you're Christian, just because you are taking a new chapter and you're being transformed and you're walking and talking differently, doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Don't be afraid of the lie that says, oh, you're Christian, then you're perfect. You have to be perfect. You can't make any mistakes. Remember what we learned today. You can demonstrate your faith by ensuring that your faith has fruits. Joy, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Ensure your faith has fruit. And just like Peter, you can have all the faith in the world, but don't be afraid to step out of the boat. Don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone because you might just be surprised and you might just manifest a miracle. But you have to believe it with all your heart. And you can't be afraid of your circumstances. And worse, more importantly, don't be afraid of failure. Because in your imperfection, in your weakness, in your failure, is an opportunity for Jesus to glorify himself. So people can see he walked out of the boat. He wanted to get closer. He fell publicly. We all saw it. But Jesus loved them so much, loved you so much, that he was there when you fell to pick you up. That's when you show people the heart of Christ, the love of Christ. Because when I fall, when I make a mistake, Jesus is there to catch me. That's the point. That's Christianity. That's demonstrating a relationship with Christ. In a relationship, you're not afraid to make mistakes. Don't get stuck in religion, but grow in relationship. Don't get stuck in religion, but grow in a relationship with Christ. One where you're allowed to make mistakes. One where you're allowed to fall. One where you're allowed to be vulnerable and demonstrate your weakness. And in that weakness, Jesus is glorified. Because Jesus is allowed to demonstrate how much he loves you. How much he wants to be close to you. But remember, step out of your comfort zone. Step out of that boat. In the middle of darkness and scary situations. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Because Jesus is real. His love is real. And there are many people here, many people connected online, living out that miracle, walking on water. Don't be afraid to go closer to Jesus. Don't be afraid to walk closer with Jesus. Don't be afraid of the failure. Don't listen to the naysayers. Focus, focus, focus on God. Focus on Jesus. Because when the Bible says that Peter looked at his circumstances, he took his eyes off Jesus. But what it doesn't tell us is how close he was. That distance doesn't matter. The moment Peter fell, the moment Peter was sinking, Jesus was right there to pick him up. He was right there. And in this moment, you might feel distant to God. You might feel distant to Jesus. But I'm here to tell you, he's right here. He's right next to you. And he ain't gonna let you go. He ain't gonna let you drown. He ain't gonna let you suffer because he's right with you. Through your weakness, we find strength. Through your weakness, we find strength. Take this moment, worship, and tell God thank you. Thank you. Because we are moved by your spirit. Because you move us to get out of our boat. You move us to get out of our comfort zone. In this moment, take these couple seconds and pray and worship and thank God for what you're doing in your life.